On this episode of Bootstrappers, we're going to speak with Brad Larson at Rentworks in San Antonio about goal setting. That's next. Welcome to Bootstrappers, a unique program designed to help make your business better. From property management to remote workers, Bootstrappers is here to help your business succeed. Bootstrappers is a production of Anaquim LLC. So let's lace up those business boots and join Bootstrappers with Jeremy and Gwen Aspen. Welcome to this episode of Bootstrappers. At Bootstrappers, we talk about topics that are important to real estate and property management entrepreneurs. I'm your host, Gwen Aspen, here with my spouse, Jeremy Aspen. What? And we're really excited to talk to Brad Larson today about goal setting. Brad is the founder of the Property Management Mastermind Conference that uh, at this recording just happened in Dallas. He's also the CEO of Rentworks in San Antonio, Texas, and he has his own podcast, the Property Management mastermind podcast and so he's the perfect person to talk about goal setting with bootstrappers is powered by anaquim and at anaquim we help transform your business we scale it and improve profitability whether it's the virtual assistance uh, full-blown back office support or an emergency call center we got you covered. If you're a fan of the show, please like, subscribe, tell all your friends. And we have an amazing book giveaway at the end of the show. So if you'd like to participate, please go into the description of this episode in our YouTube channel. Or um, you can see us at Instagram at The Bootstrappers Show. And you can click in the bio and participate in the book giveaway that way. So with that, we'd like to say hello, Brad. How are you doing today? Hey guys, thanks for having me on the show. Good, good to see you again. Good yeah, to see I didn't you. get a chance to see you in Texas, um, but uh, yeah, it sounds like you guys had a really nice yeah. conference. Brad put on yeah, an exceptional event. I had a lot of fun. I also learned a lot. And since we've come back in the last few weeks, we've been implementing um, some of the things that we learned, including making our website more user friendly. Um, and even kind of been strategic planning around some of the things that we learned at the conference. So I personally got a lot out of it, even as a vendor. I can't imagine the people there who were there simply to learn what they, they got out of it. So good job, Brad. Well, thank you. And don't shortchange yourself because you did act as a facilitator for us in the small groups. And the word in the street, the feedback was you did an excellent job. So we plan on inviting you back. Oh, fantastic. And Glad to you're hear welcome. it. And also wanted to let all your listeners know that we are clients of Anaquim and we truly feel uh, that's an industry changing solution to use remote team members. And we typically recommend uh, you guys as one of the first to check out. Uh, for what you guys provide in your services. So kudos to you and well done. Mm, oh, thank you, Brad. It. Thank you. That means a lot coming from you. So Brad, you're one of the people that I know that you say something, you have these like huge, hairy, audacious goals um, to pull a saying from Jim Collins and you implement, like you you decide and then you do. And it's really a unique thing. A lot of people say, and then, you know, it fizzles out. What is it about your the way you operate that makes it that you actually execute your big dreams? A lot of good questions there. I mean, it's really going to be the self-driven analysis of what you kind of look at yourself as. Uh, you, as a business owner leader, need to have to have the spine to be able to see those goals through, to see those implementation uh, designs all the way through to the end, because that's really what you do. We as job creators and business owners, you're expected to do that. Uh, you know, again, I do have some background in the military. I spent 10 years in the army and I was an army infantry officer. So when, when things when things are like put in front of you and you have to get stuff done, it's, it's really something that's just an inherent into my DNA at this point. But goal setting, you know, I've done several podcasts on that. I really love talking about goal setting. And, and so I want to bring up a couple things so we can kind of kick around the conversation. Now, we do a couple different things in the goal setting. I always do my personal goals. I'm looking at them right now on my left-hand screen. You know, every year I do personal goals around the December timeframe. And really, they're, they're for me and for the business. But, you know, one thing that we've done in the last two years is since, since we have implemented EOS, the Entrepreneurial Operating System, we do goal setting, an annual meeting with the entire team of RentWorks. And I got to tell you, that's been the most game changing thing ever in the business. So it's one thing to say, hey, I want to lose weight this year. Okay, all that's cool. 
you know, hey, I want to regrow some of my hair. That's a great goal <laughs> to have, you know, but it's another thing when the team sits down and you guys go through your quarterly and uh, annual goals for the year. And then you start talking about two year and five year goals. I think that's really powerful to get the team inside of that. And I'm hoping we can chat more about on that today just to kind of kick it around. Oh, yeah. No, we loved EOS and we have that strategic planning meeting as well. And it's been hugely influential in the growth of our businesses. But what are, I, real quick, what are you what's what are some of your personal goals? I mean, like mine, one of mine this year was to do 20,000 sit ups, 20,000 push ups. Uh, like that's the physical goal. Did you have do you do that, too, with your physical yeah, I mean, there's there's weight goals. I mean, you're trying to maintain uh-huh. weight. Uh, you have certain things that you want to get, like maybe one of them might be run a half marathon. Uh, also, it's, you know, your personal finances. It's not just your health necessarily, but then you have your personal finances. Do you want to set up certain things? Do you want to have so much saved? Do you want to do so many investments? Uh, do you have want to, you know, allocate enough time for family trips? I mean, those are some of the, the personal things where you could sit up and say, well, okay, 20,000 sit-ups is cool, but you know, I want to plan for a six week hiatus, like what you guys are going to be doing here, going to Michigan. Well, that takes a lot of planning. And that's really a personal thing that's joined into the hip uh, of your business. So those are all some of the goals that, you know, I put down and I put it on paper. So it's not, I'm looking at it on paper and I do that every year in the December timeframe. Some of those I share with my team, some are just for me. So when you do that, is that do you go out in the woods? Because I know you're really outdoorsy. Do you go out alone in the woods and think of your goals? You're or a where, moose killer. Where do you do it? The the whole <laughs> the whole personal planning, um, goal setting. You can do it kind of wherever you go. I mean, I run a couple three times a week, and I usually listen to some some things like audio books or podcasts, something productive. You know, I shy away from talk radio. I don't ever watch news. I think all that stuff is just it's just detrimental to your overall overall Amen. mental health. Outrage yeah, so porn. Sometimes I just uh, <laughs> yeah, porn. yeah, it is. <laughs> so while you're doing the things you do when you're listening, I think that's when I get the most out of uh, doing runs because these these goals will start to formulate inside of your mind, and you can really start to put them on paper and revise them. You talk about them with your team. Uh, you look at your last year's goals. You know, because it, once you start setting these year over year, you can reflect on last year's goals in addition to prepping them for the next year's goals. So do you keep it in like a Google Doc and it's an evolving document? Not really, just a straight up Word document. Oh, and Word document. Every year, they're pub- yeah, I, put, I publish it to myself in a PDF for a record and, and it's there for the, you know, archives. How often do you review well, what's, it? Do what's you look really at it fun, weekly? Sorry to inter- No, go ahead. Uh, yeah, probably quarterly. But here's the fun part is when you get towards the end of the year, and you start looking back on those You're goals. Like, I haven't done now, again, you want to look yet. at them probably quarterly. <laughs> yeah, well, I know. But, uh, once you start looking at them quarterly, uh, it's kind of a, a, you know, it's a way to keep you on track. But then you get into the end of the year and you say, hey, I wanted to add this many homes this year, X. Uh, we wanted to achieve this, this amount of metric in our business, X. I mean, it's, it's an interesting time. So if we start reflecting on the current market, a lot of these goals that we have are just blown out of the water. Uh, you know, that's that's a whole nother fun conversation. But the things we started this year, now the market as it is, kind of like you just throw them away and have to start over. And, yeah. and this is a very unusual year. And for example, just yesterday I was at the office and we have no rental homes on the market. No rental homes on the market. They're all rented. Meaning that normally last year, this time of year, we had 45 homes on the market at any given time. You know, 30 to 45. Now, a year later, we have zero because owners are either selling or the homes are renting in like light speed record time. It's it's just the oddest thing we've ever seen. Yeah. And Jeremy and I, we went through uh, like our P&L and some financials yesterday and we have to revise everything uh, for the for the next half of the year because we have our uh, meeting coming up, our Q3 strategic planning meeting which is part of the eos process in like three weeks and you know so now because we're so organized with our quarterly goals i know i have three that i'm a little worried about and as the the leader of a company you're like i have to have my rocks done or the team isn't going to have theirs done and or it'll set a precedent. Yeah, where, you have to oh, set a cool. precedence that we are a, a do our do say ratio as leaders has to be almost perfect, so that we set 
a good example for everybody else. Um, so is that is it better to set low expectations or set high expectations? So is it more important to actually accomplish your goals or to set up audacious goals and really work hard to get them and risk not making them? Well, good point. So let's say you were a person doing sales for your, for your company. Do you give them an outrageous, stupid, ridiculous goal they'll never reach for right. a bonus? Or do you give them like something feasible? Right. Like, hey, if you add a million homes this month, I'll give you a $1 bonus. You know, that's, that's not gonna really motivate your business development team because it's so crazy. And so you gotta keep these goals within reason and you gotta keep taking a look at them. So I'll tell you one in context is we had a goal this year to reach over a thousand homes. And I'm just hoping to maintain where we started at 900. I mean, we are literally losing homes that quickly to sales oh, yeah. as fast as we can add them. Yeah. So I'm just like, hey, if we can if we can tread water and stay at the level we are, we're doing really good. And I think a lot of management companies are getting smacked in the face right now with all of a sudden losing 25% of their inventory to sales mm -hmm. because the owners are think are, are just like, I don't I don't care if the tenant renews, kick the tenant out, I'll go vacant, and I'll sell it. And they're selling it for over asking price. And it's, it's creating this little feeding frenzy right now of people selling homes. And of course the iBuyers buyers are coming in with cash and they're buying them like crazy. And I know this is an episode about goals, but I'm trying to give you something in, in re, you know, real world, real time going on right now. Well, that's actually a really good example because we set goals and then life does happen. So it's how you talk about them. So one of the problems that we've had with goal setting before is setting too many rocks we have one person yeah. on our executive team who is notorious for putting too much on her own plate. And uh, we've let her do it, so it's a failure of our leadership. I, I blame you. <laughs> um, and then there's not making them specific enough. So like you come back to the goal, you know, th four yeah. weeks later and you're like, what does this even mean? Yeah. So, and then re reflecting on them after the quarter, to, to and having those conversations like look we didn't make this goal because the market we could never have foreseen this or we didn't make this goal because we we set you up for failure you have too many rocks rocks is another word for goals um, if you're in the eos world or this wasn't measurable enough so i can't even measure if you succeeded or failed because it was so ambiguous and that will be like like an example of that would be like create a training module create training modules for whatever role well what training modules right. what format are the training modules in and when they're really ambiguous yeah you might reach it but did you really was it what was it what you intended on achieving so i would say that um, if you're going to start if you've not been a goal, goal setter in the past and you're gonna start, expect that you won't meet your first quarter goals or your second quarter goals because you're gonna make some mistakes. Would you agree? Is that your experience too, Brad, or is that just us? No, I agree. And you have to take a, a quick look at them probably once a quarter. And it does tie into your EOS. Mm -hmm. So for example, our quarterly meeting is gonna be the end of, uh, well, we're, we're filming this early June. The end of June is our quarterly meeting. And that's where we look at what the past quarter has done and prepare for the next quarter. And just what I mentioned before with the, you know, the status of the business, with the sales taking a lot, a lot of doors out of the inventory, uh, that's going to be a big focus of, okay, how do we adjust? How do we correct? How do we make sure we're doing the right things we are doing? You know, how do we retain more homes? How do we add more homes? All those things will be talked about and the goals may be revised at that point for the 2021 year. And just having it on paper, gives you an outline to go through every quarter. And, you know, again, I'm a big fan of the U.S. like you guys are. Uh, it really has changed the status of our business, and I would highly recommend people check it out and look into it. How long have you been doing it? Going on two years. Okay. And and so what really wanted, what we wanted to do was create, again, uh, an operating system for the, I know it sounds cliche, but the operating system for the team to run the business without me necessarily. Absolutely, so, that's not cliche. Yeah. That's just like goal, a, a, a huge goal for many business owners. So, and, but uh, you know right. what? One thing that it isn't is like uh, I, I think that 
business owners kind of get a bad rap for, you know, delegation, using that word delegate. Um, and like they're trying to not do anything. But really what we're trying to do is we're trying to put ourselves in a position where the operation can run and we can actually try to look forward and find some audacious goals to achieve and really try to help make sure that our company can not just survive, but thrive, mm -hmm. which gives the lives and, and the careers of all of our employees a boost or, or a hope. And to that point, people talk about delegation as being bad. Like I think a lot of people have a emotional holdup of not being the first one in the office and the last one to leave because they just grew up being like, hey, I have to be the example for everybody. And so when they start taking a step back, they feel like they're failing their team. But um, I had a mentor once say, hey, Gwen, do you think you're selfish? And I was like, I am not selfish. He's like, mm, maybe a little selfish. And I was like, what are you talking about? And he's like, well, you don't delegate anything. You're not teaching anybody below you how to be better because you're not giving them the skills that they need to move up. So I think it's kind of selfish. And it was kind of tongue in cheek, but he made a really good point that if we save all the strategic stuff for ourselves, we're not elevating our people and helping them live their best lives. So the EOS system, really is a process to help people uh, delegate, set goals, and even become better business people themselves. Well, and hold people accountability for with the KPIs. Like We go over them every single week. What's a um, KPI? Uh, key performance indicator. <laughs> um, but uh, so how long do you look forward in, in, into the future for goal setting? So I'll just start off with saying financially, uh, when I came from corporate America, they had us do a one-year, three-year, and five-year plan, which I thought was absolutely idiotic because it never actually worked. Now, the first one, yeah, you need to have a, a one-year um, goal, uh, budget, and you can get there, And I mean, because that becomes attainable. But when you get to three years and five years, I never really saw it as useful because you were never going to be right. But what I will say what I found to be fun about three, five, and 10 year goals is that you can just kind of start to dream. And that's valuable in its own right. Like when you think of a 10 year goal, you are starting to think at our age, like, where do I want to retire? <laughs> or at my age anyway, not yours. <laughs> but so that's really the only purpose I see for those. But what do you, how do you view the uh, goal setting into the future? No, great point, sir, because as part of the EOS model, they want you to do a 10 year vision, you know, the BHAG, big, hairy, audacious goal, 10 year. And I, just, I don't believe in that. I really am more like you, Jeremy, and the one, three, and five. Even five is kind of like speculative, really, mm -hmm. but it does wake and kind of don't wake you up. So, for example, you know, we had that big, hairy, audacious goal of we want to get to 2,500 doors in five years, right? And I know it's a door count, but really it's, it's, it's a meaning of that we want to double, double and a half in size. And so what does that mean? It means that we're going to have to look at doing acquisitions versus organic growth, because I believe this market that we're in is tapped out for organic growth. I mean, you can still maintain, you can still add gradually, slowly, but no one can come in and just say, hey, I'm gonna add a thousand doors this year, you know, unless they just in a cut their market. legs out. Right. Yeah, and so the way to do that is doing more acquisition strategies and so that sets the tone for what we do now to hopefully have that pay off three years from now. Right. Okay. In addition, another good point is we're terrible at forecasting. My, my team, my accounting coordinators, they're not trained or skilled or ever even been shown how to do a forecast. We're talking hardcore spreadsheet, CPA, accounting, doctorate degree level forecasting for a business. And so when we start looking at the three and five year goals, we want to be able to forecast what our numbers will potentially look like right now this year, which will also help us in the three to five year goals. So you see kind of where I'm going with that is there's two examples of when you do those longer five year goals, you have to set up stuff now to even put yourself in a position mm -hmm. to consider those a realistic opportunity to achieve. Yeah, and scaling up a budget, for instance, it's important that the company knows what they do. Because, so for instance, you need to know that you're going to be a single family home property manager, for instance, and that that property manager, or that that portfolio is going to bring you $100 of revenue per month. And then you can have, you can set up a sales team to bring on 10, 20 new places 
per month. And that is the sort of formula, if you know what you're doing and you know what you're going after and you have an infrastructure that'll support it, you can project long to the future with some accuracy. But man, it's really hard, especially when you get to the costing side of things and then you throw in things like the economy, <laughs> things like that, mm -hmm. uh, inflation. Well, that's a good point. So this is where I think you are different than other people. So like, for instance, let's just talk about the conference. You were like, I'm gonna start a property management conference and I'm sure you hit a bunch of roadblocks along the way, right? I mean, what- well, sure, yeah, you're always, you're always gonna, I mean, the big roadblock this year was COVID. I mean, that's a huge one, we, though. Yeah. Oh, did you? Yeah, yeah. That we, affected we got, you? <laughs> yeah, exactly. We got through the skin of our teeth in the first conference. We we were there in March, and the week after we left our first conference, the world shut down with COVID. Okay, and so we were going to have the conference back in Vegas this year, but Vegas was shut down, and just till recently. And so we had to move the conference. So there's a challenge. Hey, you, you had to. We had a three-year contract with. Uh, the Palms, and I don't even think the Palms is open yet. <laughs> so we had to adjust fire and move the whole conference to Texas just to be able to find an open venue. And it turned out great. I mean, everything happens for a reason. We did it a great job on that one. Um, so it just one of those things that you just got to adjust fire with certain things when things don't go your way. But if you're paying attention to your goals, you'll be able to get to it. But But in the middle of that, like there was a moment, I'm sure, where you you all were moving forward and maybe let's just say people signed up really late because they weren't sure how they felt about it or how the vaccine was or whatever and you woke up a few mornings going i don't know if this is gonna work i'm sure right oh, absolutely. I mean, so it, how do you was stressful how do you get through those moments because that's where people quit and that's where you don't quit and that's kind of what separates people who execute things uh i mean it's really fun to dream about the idea and then, you know, three weeks into any goal, it starts to suck until mm -hmm. it finishes up. And that's the moment where you have to have, you have to say something to yourself. How do you get yourself through those really tough parts? Well, a big part too is just what you mentioned earlier was delegation. So I had a really good team of Sammy and Becca and they're doing all the work essentially of executing the conference. I just kind of, you know, put together my ideas. I'm the visionary, but they're the actual integrators implementers of those ideas so it goes back to your point of being able to delegate and trust your people to do that so it's just it's also something that people have to get used to and being able to delegate some of those things away from their plate to be able to grow in the bigger side so when you run into problems um or, or failures roadblocks uh do you see does that how do you reflect back on them uh, do you spend, is it a good use of time for you to go back and look at the issues you've encountered or do you just kind of put them in the back and move forward? Well, I do think you have to learn from your mistakes. So there is a, a, a fine line of reflection and a fine line of just like blowing it off. I mean, it's just, it's almost like a golf analogy, a baseball analogy to where if you strike out or if you hit a bad shot in golf, you have to have a, a short memory and learn from that potentially but learn from that strikeout, learn from that, that last you know, swing and miss, or learn from a bad putt that you have to adjust for the next opportunity. And I know that's a pretty lame analogy, trying to use a sport analogy, no, but it, works. Uh, it does hold true in business where if you do make a mistake, and I've made a lot of them. Um, another good example is accounting. I made a lot of accounting mistakes with the business. You guys know some of the backstory oh, yeah. there, but that also led to implementing the NARPM accounting standards. Right. And I think that's, a, you know, to your point earlier, Jeremy, you're talking about X hundred dollars of revenue per door. Right. And I challenge it. I challenge you on this. You probably know this. A lot of management companies have no idea those numbers. They have no idea those metrics. They can't even gauge that because they don't have any sort of legitimate accounting. And that's where the NARPM accounting standards can help them because those formulas that you just mentioned about what's your revenue per door, those are all built into that. And I know it's common sense. You take your revenue, divide by the number of doors you manage. Okay, you get it. But then digging deeper into, okay, what is your maintenance expense? What are your sales expense? What's your average profit per home per unit per month? You know, your PPU, your profit per unit. Those metrics are in the NARPM accounting standards, which will give you ideas for goal setting. And then what's even more useful, like to have those numbers is one of the most useful things that a property management company can do. But then the trick becomes an ability to calibrate your operation to meet those expectations. 
that's where things start to get a little bit tricky. That's where the goal setting, the weekly KPI reviews, the, the quarterly rocks and goals, they all need to kind of focus around that ultimate objective so that at the end of the day, next year, you know exactly what the numbers are supposed to be, that you have an operation that can meet those, and then you can kind of uh, draw a trajectory uh, to see what your top line is and your bottom line. And that's why our budgeting is usually pretty accurate because if you don't know those things, one, you don't even know what your company does well, right? I mean, when it comes right down to it, you need to know what your PPU is. You need to know what your RPU is so that the, the profit per unit and the, the revenue per unit is um, so that you can know what you're doing on a daily basis and what to expect from your from your employees. Here's a good, good piece in the side uh, to tie into exactly what you guys do with Anaquim and assisting with hiring remote team members for property managers. So let's let's rewind a little bit. Let's say seven, eight, nine years ago, really before remote team members took off in you know wide use in the industry. Of course, we've always had a, a few, but I remember a drill that was done at a conference to where they were analyzing property management companies and looking at their staffing ratio. And you're shaking your head, Gwen, because I think you might remember this to where. Uh, we might have even met at that conference, if I believe, I, if I remember it. But where I'm going with this is we did a quick analysis of like about 30 management companies. And they came in and they gave their numbers. And the average spend on the staffing ratio was around 50 to 55% on average, if you guys remember that. Yep. And ours has decreased since by adding and using remote team members down to below 40%. So we decreased our expenses by implementing remote team members wide scale. We have 13 remote team members. And again, we were one of your, your earlier clients in that regard with Anaquim. So that's the kind of stuff that's really changed the industry. And what we look at in a metric is your staffing ratio. Like how much of your revenue are you spending on personnel? And it's lowered since we started, be, started to use remote team members four plus years ago on a wide scale. And that's what is really exciting if you think about it. So let's say we just saved ourselves 10% in expenses. Well, guess what? That's 10% more profit that you made per home, per unit, you know, taken to the aggregate. Yeah, and to put it into, I mean, to even clarify it more, if you have a million dollar revenue company, which a lot of property management companies do, that's an extra $100,000 of take home. That's a real, that's a salary of a well-paid person that you get to keep just by having streamlined, well, payroll in well, this case. And I think that this is another testament to why it's important that business owners do get out of the weeds of the business because they can spend the time really reviewing the numbers and really coming up with a plan to move the business forward that meets their five-year goals, their three-year goals, and their one-year goals. If you don't have time in your day when you're not exhausted at 10 o'clock at night to review your numbers and to really see where you wanna go and how what you're doing today is gonna to get you there, um, because you're in the weeds and you're putting out fires, you're not really gonna have the execution of those dreams happen, right? Yeah, and agreed. And so one of the things that we always wanna talk about is the how. Uh, it's a great idea to throw it on paper to say, I want to increase my profit by 10%. You know, that's a great right. bullet point for a goal on your goal sheet. Increase profits by 20%. Then you start asking how. Well, how do I do that? Well, you really have to shave expenses or you have to recreate your whole design to say, okay, instead of hiring five people locally at, at $40,000 a person for a cost of $200,000 a year, I'm going to hire eight people remote team members that will cost me 50,000 a year, right? And so you do the math on that, like, oh, there it is. That's how I, I have to redo the processes. So when people are answering their frontline phones, they're answering those frontline phones in a different location in, in Mexico, for example. And that's going to allow you to shave costs. Now, nobody likes, necessarily likes to export jobs, but uh, I think that we're also creating pretty good well-paying jobs by doing well, some of these actions. So we run into this once in a while where someone will make an accusation that you know, you're know you taking jobs from, from Americans. So there's two points. One, no, we're probably taking, taking them from Filipinos. Or, or, or from the Philippines. From the Philippines. Um, 
you know, I mean, that's probably true, but also it's not that we're taking jobs from Americans, it's that we're making American companies stronger. And that is absolutely true because like if you can take that 10%, uh, reduce um, the, the payroll by 10%, you're making it so that that company is far more viable and so that that company has the assets available to be able to thrive longer. And invest the in the company more so it can grow faster. Yeah. Well, and let's also say um, a lot of small mom and pop shops don't make it through to retirement because the whole thing was about them. And if you're setting your company up correctly, then you can position it to a place where the company can sell and where your employees will have a longer term future than you as the original uh, founding member of it, um, which I think gets us to another point about how, you know, we all ultimately want to sell our companies. And I remember hearing something about you and brokering PM companies. Is that, did I hear that right? Yeah, yeah. One of the things that I, I really do love about this industry is the fact that you're building an asset and you're still in the middle of real estate. So you're still doing sales, you're still doing management, uh, and then you're building a capital asset, basically a capital value. So when you're done using this cash generating business, you can turn around and sell it for a large amount. Now, I partnered up with Phil Mazur and we started the property manager broker. And this is a business brokerage specifically focusing on only property management companies. So that's all we're going to be working with and buying and selling is PM companies. And we're not selling Valeros. We're not selling, you know, dry cleaners. We're just focusing on the property management companies. And both of us are highly involved in the NARPM accounting standards and understanding what the value is of property management companies. Our intent is to actually increase the value of these management companies by actually having some good metrics behind them because here's one fact nobody knows exactly what uh, a metric should be for what they should be selling it at nobody knows the the, the numbers the uh just one you percent know, of what well you know it's one x of revenue five x of ebitda nobody knows really it's all just rumors and conjecture so you know we hope to establish a baseline to where we increase the value of the entire industry because i think that it's, it's never going to go away the the giant acquirers out there will only gobble up a small percentage and the mom and pops because of the the markets being unique in every place will always have a spot in this world uh so you'll never be able to i mean we have an insulation by fragmentation situation going on to where there's we're just so fragmented that nobody can come in and just say hey we're the we're the uber of property management and all the taxi drivers are going to go away it's never going to happen in our industry and so we always want to make sure that people understand that we're very protected and it makes it very valuable. So keep building that capital asset by getting good accounting. A good accounting is the absolute fundamental bedrock. And if you look at it in a different way, not so much prepping to sell, but what if you need to prep to buy? If you have really good accounting and your next door competitor knocks elbows with you at a buffet and says, hey, come over here. I want you to, I want you to buy my company. And then you go to a bank and the bank says, your financials are all jacked up. You haven't had uh, yeah. reconciliations done in six years. Oh, I'm not giving you anything. But if you can present them solid financials that are reconciled to the T, any bank is going to look at you and say, yeah, I, I can work with you and get you a loan. Uh, so let's, let's get this done. So we're actually working with Enterprise right now to create a specific loan product for property management acquisitions. And so we had a really good conversation with them. Uh, I think we can pre create something to where it's a it's a, a good product for property management companies to get into to where they can go acquire other management companies. Now I'm not talking you know, the giant, you know, 50 billion, you know, pro uh, venture capital money type acquirers. I'm talking like the the five million dollar revenue or less acquirers working with this loan product to purchase other management companies because when people want to exit, they should be exiting first to their local market. You know, then maybe to go to a national brand. So for for this service, do you come in and kind of consult first, like see where somebody is, or who who should come and talk to you? If who's your ideal client for this product? Well, really, anybody who's looking to sell their management company, because what we can do is in our process, we're going to run them through a sealed bid auction type of a scenario. So we will come in, look at their books, look at their numbers, recommend a minimum type of a price, like an eBay type of situation. And then we're going to either white label them or fully disclose and put them on the market for the highest bidder 
and we run the sealed bid auction. So that gets the management company the absolute highest best price and highest best terms to sell to whomever they want to. So it's, what if what if I want to sell in five years? What should I should I do? Well, clearly get your books in order. That's the first thing. And so that could be a no brainer. But, you know, we can advise you get yourself on get on the NARPA accounting standards. Number one, uh, get reconciled. Uh, numbers. So you go to a CPA, you go to a, a book providing source. I would even recommend looking into hiring uh, one of those those services out there. And I could name four or five of them. You guys might even offer this. But there's bookkeeping services done by remote team members that can really put them in a good situation to where they can have their books managed on a professional level monthly. Yeah. So when it comes year end, they have they have year end financials that look glorious. And come five years later, they have five years of year end financials that look absolutely stunning. And any acquirer acquirer, sorry, I gotta <laughs> get my head off. Any acquirer is gonna look at that and say, Yes, I love those books. Uh, I love your business. I'm willing to offer you X. Uh, here it is. Let's go. And so, yeah, you bring that up. Anaquim, we do offer that as part of our uh, as part of our back office support service because one, it makes it easier for us to be able to do the data entry because if it's a utility bill, you don't want to go into everybody's chart of accounts and call it something different for Christ's sake. Um, and two, after a certain amount of time, we can throw in there an analysis that says you're spending too much on this because it starts to become very self evident once you have those that chart of accounts established and you're using it, you know where you're spending too much money, right? That's the nice thing about it. So it sounds like you've got another big, hairy, audacious goal, and that's to change property management uh, uh, from the buyer-seller perspective. Yeah, another goal. Yeah, and it guy. really, it, it's a new twist on it because especially with the sealed bid auction type of a format that we're going to be running on these sales. Uh, you know how it is in listing a home for sale right now or even a business for sale right now. You list it for for fun, a million bucks. Well, everyone wants to talk you down from that number. If you don't put a, a price out there, an asking price, you'll be amazed at what you would get in the bidding process with, uh, you know, I could probably name five to 10 acquirers right now who'd be happy to bid. You know, if I presented a management company in Omaha with 500 doors, you guys would be the first in line to, to possibly bid on them. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Why, you got somebody? <laughs> yeah, I, yeah I, I wish. But uh, no, it's going to be becoming more and more uh, of a thing. We're, we're really starting to roll this out a bit more. Uh, we're going to be at the conferences advertising. We're going to be talking more about it. We have a podcast. We have a website. You know, I am a licensed business broker here in the state of Texas. And we can do all these things legit. And Phil Mazur is also a valuator. He's and awesome. So he's been too. trained. In, yeah, he's been trained in valuing companies. He's gone through many acquisitions. And so we're poised really to uh, make a, a huge dent in the industry as far as making a difference for these sellers, because they often want to, if they want to sell, they go to a, either they're doing it themselves, they're screwing it up, they're going to an attorney, mm -hmm. attorney's going to drag it out because attorneys are motivated by an hourly wage, mm -hmm. not an actual deal getting done. Right. Okay. There's a different in intentions there, or they go to a business broker and the, you have to explain to a business broker what a home is what what property <laughs> management is what what a tenant is right. what a contract you have to explain it to them because they don't know and they're just going to throw it up with a list price on bizbysell.com and hope for the best and so they're really not getting any services that's going to advise them on getting a, a what they want and that's where we start we ask the seller okay what do you want not necessarily financially but do you want to own or finance do you want to you know take cash and run mm -hmm. and, and sit on the beach forever you know we start with the the seller owner and say okay what do you want and how do we help you get to that goal that's great okay so i also before we take off we want to talk about the next conference because the property management mastermind conference was phenomenal in Dallas. So how do people sign up for next year and what information do you have about it? Sure. So we've got it set for May 16, 17, 18 in the Red Rock Resort Casino in Las Vegas, uh, May of 2022. So it's at pmmcon.com. And we're doing a, an additional, basically a, a same type of a two and a half day format. Uh, I'm predicting we're going to have an EOS 
workshop to kick it off on the Monday afternoon. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, I think so. And then we'll do the same small group. So you're going to be a facilitator in those small yes. groups on the Tuesday, the first full day of the conference. And then we're, we're, we're thinking on the, the second day, the last day, we're going to do some breakout sessions. Now, mixed into all that, we have some marquee main stage kick butt speakers that are going to come in and really generate some great thought for those small groups in addition to some awesome breakout seminars and so i think that's going to be a real good situation not to mention the awards banquet was super fun it Live was band plate of dinner uh tuxedo jeremy i was so glad you weren't there this year <laughs> i know you had a pretty <laughs> date yeah i had a real pretty date. her name was glenn she got to hang out with us at the table and, and so yeah i'm like looking around like oh i'm so glad jeremy's not here <laughs> <laughs> so no, we'll be looking forward to that. And then because we're so EOS focused, what do you think about our book giveaway being the traction traction again? It's just the quintessential book to get started on EOS. Would you agree? Uh, absolutely agree. I think I've listened to that book uh, three times. You know, I, you guys know me. I'm big on audio. I don't read a lot. I've got a few books in the background, but I never sit down and read. Those but are darn from it, high school. I will listen to. Yeah, right. I'll sit down and, <laughs> and listen to something all day long. I'm going to pull out Traction. Right yeah, I see this. it right there. Here's the book, Traction. Traction so. by Gino Wickman. Fantastic book. I mean, you can pay a lot of money to have a facilitator, which I think is actually worth it for a lot of people to start you on EOS. But if you're like us and you don't have those resources or you're not willing to spend the money, you can also just pay $14.99 for the book and implement it yourself. So you can we'll, do some self implementation. I would highly recommend a facilitator yeah. to make sure that goes smoothly. And it's not the one time they have to come in and do a lot of the meetings for you. And that's where they pull the magic out of the business. Yes. Right? And where it's the business expensive. owner can kind of shut up and sit in the background. And then the facilitator implementer is pulling out that information of your team mm -hmm. to where the business owner right. hardly ever has to speak. Right. Yes, That's it is right. awesome. Well, we want to th thank you so much, Brad, for being on the Bootstrapper Show. You're always a wealth of wisdom, and it sounds like you have another goal yeah. up your sleeve it's that I have no doubt you'll execute flawlessly. And it's really <laughs> nice seeing you on a screen with my wife not next to you <laughs> in your cowboy you guys. hat. <laughs> <laughs> you guys. All right. Well, thanks, thanks a million, again, man. Brad. We'll look forward to seeing you guys at the conference here this year, Jeremy. You know, you don't have to wear a cowboy hat this next year because it's going to be in Vegas. I've got so one. So the Texas theme is no longer. Oh, but you're welcome to show up in your, <laughs> you know, your James Bond outfit. You hit the, the awards banquet and then go straight down to the casinos like you are the boss. Yeah. You make, are the boss. Make them all look funny. <laughs> I'll, I'm looking like the cool guy. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Thanks, Brad. And that's a wrap on Bootstrappers this week. This has been Bootstrappers, a unique presentation designed to help you better understand how the world turns. Contact Gwen or Jeremy at posts at bootstrappers.club or visit our website, anaquim.net. Be sure to subscribe to our podcasts on Apple, Google Play, Spotify, and our YouTube channel. Thank you and join us next time for Bootstrappers. <laughs>